everyone, Matthew LaCroix here. I'm joined by Billy Carson for an epic mastermind discussion and presentation, Lost Civilizations, Human Origins, and Forbidden Knowledge. So today we're gonna to be doing something special where Billy and I are gonna be dual reading the Enuma Elish and the Emerald Tablets so we can understand these secrets of the past. Billy, what have you been up to and how are you, my friend? Oh, uh, first of all, thanks for having me back on. It's been a long time since we've done this. And I'm really excited about it. I was really looking forward to it. And I'm glad everything worked out <clears throat> with the weather so that we can make this connection. Um, you know, since we last uh, did a video, I've been all over the world. I've probably been around the world twice now <clears throat> in the last uh, two years. Uh, it's just been amazing. I mean, everywhere from Cambodia, Hong Kong, uh, South Korea, <laughs> Vietnam. Uh, you know, uh, I've been to Accra Tittery in Greece to go to an ancient dig site. Um, you know, I've been... I've just been about everywhere, Peru, the Nazca Lines, uh, Machu Picchu, um, the Sacred Valley, <clears throat> Ali and Tumbo, Saxuoma. I mean, you, I can just keep going on and on. I've been to a lot of places, and what's happened is I've really, uh, you know, dug into the field research kind of firsthand uh, and went and talked to a lot of homegrown archaeologists, a lot of um, uh, homegrown researchers that have grown up in the area so that I can get a little bit of information about what's really gone on in the ancient past, what they think happened. <clears throat> and it always comes to the same thing. A lot of people are always saying, the people that live there, grew up there, know the traditions, always say the same thing, that these weren't built by us, they were built by the gods. And it's really amazing. I mean, you know, um, so it's just been an amazing journey, man. And I'm so happy to be able to even, um, you know, get write the book, put the book out. It's doing phenomenal. Your book is phenomenal right here, uh, The Stage of Time. I really appreciate this book, man. I just started digging into it. And it's so amazing how similar you know, our points of view are and everything and, and reference to the ancient past and ancient history and the amount of, re I respect you for the amount of research that you've done to, people don't realize what it takes to be able to put this kind of information out and this level of quality. You really have to be a student of, of the mysteries and a student of, of the uh, ancient history. So I appreciate it, man. Thank you. So that's been really good. Hey, Billy, it's an honor. I, I really, um, it's an amazing to hear those kind words from you, especially coming from someone of, of your um, importance you know, I'm, it really is an honor. I have not had a chance to travel quite as much as Billy. I'm to say I'm jealous is an understatement, I think. <laughs> um, but hopefully someday I can get there. Okay, Billy and I are going to jump in now into some slides and we're going to review some evidence in chronological order. And we're going to start by trying to understand where human civilizations came from. You know, a lot of times I meet people who they're sitting down, they're pondering outside and they're wondering, you know, where do we come from? Where do human civilizations come from? Where does knowledge, mathematics, laws, where, do all, where does all that stuff come from? And they, and they honestly like asking that question because they don't know. And of course, if you go and you go through the, um, the education system we have in school, you, you're taught that human civilization is 6,000 years old or less and that everything developed in Mesopotamia, which is true, except for the age is wrong and where it came from is wrong. And what I mean by wrong, that's a, I know that's a pretty um, blunt statement, but we have evidence that tells us where it came from. So we don't have to guess anymore. So many people aren't aware of this information. I think that's one of the things that, that we're trying to correct now. And, and Billy and I doing this work is that we're trying to point out and say, hey, look, we have evidence that directly tells us where all these, th these things came from, tells mm -hmm. us who we really are, tells us this lost history. And we're now at the point where we're trying to put those pieces together to understand it. And so what, what, what I'm showing on the screen right now, this is what is known as Eridu. Now, if you wanted to try to find out, you, if you ask yourself, well, what is the evidence that tells us where any of this stuff came from? What, what is, where is it and where does it come from? Because I, I, don't, I don't really believe this stuff. So, some of this information seems way too far-fetched. You know, it really goes against this doctrine we're told. So provide us some concrete evidence. Well, that evidence comes from four places and Billy can chime in as we're going here and we discuss it. And I've, I've categorized four cuneiform tablets that provide concrete evidence for all of those questions that I just asked. And those four tablets are the Eridu Genesis, the Sumerian King List, the Code of Hammurabi, and the Legend of Atanya. In each of those cuneiform tablets, it's, it specifically describes where all of those moral laws and codes and mathematics and astronomy. It tells where all that, that stuff came from. And on top of that, the Sumerians clearly state that in, in many other places as well, including cylinder seals where they show that. Mm -hmm. 
okay? And so I want to just provide you a quick little quote, and I'm, Billy is going to be very familiar with this, that, that is the opening line of the Sumerian king list, okay? And what it says is, when kingship was lowered from heaven, kingship was an Eridu. Right, Billy? Absolutely, and that's huge because that gives us an idea of where the very first city was here on earth uh, and uh, where, they, where these kings or these gods, quote unquote, kind of kickstarted civilization here. Uh, I really think it was like a breakaway civilization from their planet to here. And, and that's, one of the, that's one of these great mysteries that still remains is, you know, where if, if all this knowledge was handed down and given, first, the cor- first question, of course, is where did it come from and who provided it right and those and those questions then lead to asking even more questions that go mm-hmm. deeper and deeper down this rabbit hole trying to figure out where where the origins of everything come from now i wanted right. to i wanted to point out something is that some people have looked at the sumerian king list and they've said okay that stuff seems sounds like a fairy tale it just can't be real well the way that you can can know that something like the sumerian king list is authentic is to then compare the information that's that's discussed in it with another cuneiform tablet and I want to mention that, I've, and I've mentioned this before in other shows, some of these tablets came from completely different locations, sometimes yep. hundreds of miles away. So to have mm-hmm. information be, be carried over shows you that, number one, that information is probably true. And number two, it's, it's most likely come from a civilization that was connected. And so yep. where that comes from, that, that we can find that same information, is the Eridu Genesis. And that is one of these cuneiform tablets that I think is largely unknown. And, and, and is discussed very little. And I have the full translations from, including the Eridu Genesis in, in the stage of time, because that's how important this is in my opinion. So what the Eridu Genesis states, I'm just gonna read the first two paragraphs, because again, I want you to notice those terms. The terms I want you to look for are, when you read the Sumerian King List, it mentions these certain cities in chronological order that were founded, okay? It says Eridu was the first city on earth. Then it says, that Bad Tabira was the second city, followed by Larak, Sippar, mm. and then finally Sharupak. Now, what's, what's important to understand about that is that Sharupak is mentioned in these tablets as being the last city in Mesopotamia before it was all destroyed and everything had to start over again, okay? So what the Eridu Genesis says is it starts by saying, when the royal scepter was coming down from heaven, the august crown and the royal throne being already down from heaven, the king regularly performed to perfection the august divine services and offices and laid the bricks of those cities in pure spots. The firstling of the cities, Eridu, she gave to the leader, Nunamud. The second, Bad Tabira, she gave to the prince and the sacred one. The third, Larak, she gave to Palisag. The fourth, Sippar, she gave to the gallant Utu. The fifth, Sharupak, she gave to Ansud. And so, not only does it, it's not like it mentions one of those cities or another one of those cities. Every single one is exactly mentioned in the order that the Sumerian king list sets. Mm-hmm. Now, and I want Billy to chime in after this. What's important about that is if you add up the dates given for what they call shars, when they listed out the reigns of these kings that rule these cities, you get a history that would go back 200,000 years ago. And yeah. I know that would throw a wrench in everything we've ever been taught, especially when you look at how we're told in school that human civilization is less than 6,000 years old. So basically, Billy, this paints an entirely different picture about our past, doesn't it? Uh, This is incredible because it shatters our religious systems literally in one second. And uh, this is why this information is not taught in schools, because obviously the religious systems are a multi-trillion dollar industry and they can't have people uh, just going into this ancient information and learning it and bypassing that system. But um, this is really earth shattering information, the fact that you can discover this information on two different stone tablets. And one thing I really wanna point out, not the fact that they're so far apart, but, but the fact that somebody took the time to etch these into clay with a cuneiform stylus. I don't know if anybody's ever watched it being done, but I have, uh, at, uh, there's a professor you know, at the uh, Cambridge uh, Library uh, and he does these, uh, and he has a YouTube channel where he shows you how to do it. And let me tell you something. At the British Museum, there's also uh, Mr. Finkel, who does it as well. Does an excellent job showing how to do the cuneiform. He writes some cuneiform into some wet clay. It's such a tedious process. So you're thinking, tens of thousands of years ago, somebody's got to sit down, 
get the clay out, get a stylus out, and take so many hours upon hours to create this information and then bake it and so forth so it can stand, withstand the test of time. They didn't have time to do this for fun. This wasn't just like, I'm going to sit down and make a whole cuneiform tablet today just for the heck of it and make up some information. I mean, they really put down important uh, information into these tablets, things they thought would be prudent for future generations to see. Exactly. And, and it's not even just that they wanted you know, these specific stories to be known because, oh, this was just an event that occurred. They were so smart that these stories that they created were written in such a way that it's like this perfect harmonic rhythm to them. And, mm -hmm. it, and it, at the same time, while they describe both actual events that occurred in the past and this important symbolism and all these metaphors and these lessons that we can learn along the way, but they provide in a complete glimpse in this lost viewpoint into where human origins came from and where it all began in the very, in the, in the very first place. I mean, try to imagine over 50,000 years ago, just try to imagine, I mean, think of everything that human civilization has accomplished in the last 500 years. Mm -hmm. Now try to imagine more than 50,000 years ago, these civilizations that are all being handed this information and they're rising up and agriculture is blossoming all around the planet. And you're seeing this emergence of human civilization that's spreading out around the planet. And then what happens? Well, it reaches a certain, certain sophistication and then it's wiped out and destroyed. And then human civilization has to rebuild itself again. Now, when I mentioned those four tablets that, are, that I said are crucial, I didn't read any, anything from the last two that I mentioned, but I want to bring it up. How do you know that these events occurred? Like, how do we know these, what I just mentioned, Eridu and, and Sharupak, how do we know those cities were from that far ago, right? How do we know how old they are? How do we know how to accurately create this timeline? You basically have to look at evidence from a large spectrum of of, of um, our area to, to understand. And the first mm -hmm. thing you want to look at is you compare things like geologic evidence you get from around the world, looking at, oh my God, the landscape was disastrously scarred by these events that occurred the last ice age. And then you look at things like ice core samples and you can pinpoint when these different climatic zones occurred. And mm -hmm. then you can take these ancient cuneiform stories and then match them up based on the events they describe and how old they say they are. So mm -hmm. when the Sumerian king list and, um, and, the, and the Eridu Genesis talk about these ancient cities, you, people that are then going to say, well, well, how do we distinguish what's before and what's after? Here's where really paying attention to this stuff comes in, comes in important. When you look at something like the legend of Atanya, and here is yet again another one of these incredibly important tablets that I hear almost nobody talk about. Okay, and that is remarkable because the legend of Atanya is the only tablet that talks about the events that occurred right after the flood. It specifically mentions that there was a city in Mesopotamia that was then created, the first one of all. So you could call Eridu the first city in human civilization ever, according to these records. Then the first city after everything was destroyed was called Kish. And Kish is what's was known as these post-Diluvian. Um, mm -hmm. civilizations, okay? And that's, that means that everything we know of, when we think of um, all these things handed, re-handed down and then civilization restarting in Mesopotamia like we're told in school, that's all part of this post-Diluvian history. This is all part of this new epic that occurred with this restarting of human civilization over again. And that's mm -hmm. why these time periods are so confused, wouldn't you say, Billy? Yep, absolutely. I mean, it's so, it gets a little convoluted, so you really got to pay attention. And I'm glad you brought up the ice cores. Um, you know, there's a show by Greg Braden, the famous Greg Braden, a uh, great guy. I uh, had the pleasure of meeting him and being in some episodes with him on a few shows. He's on a show called Missing Links. Uh, it's on Gaia. But he talks about the, the, that entire first episode on season one is all about the ice core samples. Digging into the ice cores, matching it up, like you just said, to ancient history and events, global events that have happened, and you get the records stored in the ice core. You can detect when we've had global warming in the past, and then you begin to see this cycle that it happens every so many thousands of years. You begin to see the cycle of every so many thousands of years, you get an ice age. You begin to see the cycle of every so many thousands of years, you get some type of a geological disaster that happens on the planet. You can see the different oxygen levels, different atmospheric gases of the plant life. All that information is in the ice core. 
So, I mean, literally, when you study these ice cores, you can now then predict the future of the planet. And to be honest with you, a lot of people are really getting worried about the global warming and everything else. We're right on track with the ice core said we were going to be exactly right now. This is not something, to be honest with you, out of the ordinary. It's actually something that's part of our cyclical, cyclical nature of this um, geological pattern on this planet. Uh, and, but, but the amazing thing is those ice cores line up with these ancient tablets, which is why I talk about the fact that I really believe that the Great Sphinx and the Great Pyramid are, are probably about 36,000 years old. Because if you go back two additional processional periods to match up the, the, uh, the Sphinx with the constellation of Leo, you end up around 36,000 years ago when according to the ice cores and according to the Emerald Tablets, it's the perfect time to build the Giza Plateau, to build the Great Pyramid. So it kind of really gives you, it helps you paint a, a, a good picture about what's going on. And the other thing is, like you said, finding these tablets all around the world, Chief Joseph, which was a Native American Indian that was unburied in North America, was unburied from a, a, a burial tomb in North America and what was in his pocket? A Sumerian tablet written in cuneiform text. So the Sumerians had contact with Native American, indigenous and Native Americans thousands of years ago in the North Americas, proving again that they had traveled the entire globe. They, they also found in, uh, in Mesoamerica, Sumerian uh, writing, which they call Proto-Sumerian, but that's even on Wikipedia, I mean, anybody can look it up. They even had a metric system back then. So when I tell people about you know, the fact that the Grand Gallery and the Great Pyramid is the longitude of the numbers match the speed of light in by meters per second, well, people go, oh no, we didn't have meters back then. Oh yes, we did. <laughs> they had meters thousands of years ago. Everything we have now is just a rediscovery. Exactly, that's really well said. And we're gonna be getting into some of, those, some of those pieces of evidence from other parts of the world that prove that there was this global civilization and global connection that once occurred around the planet that was completely destroyed and wiped out. And Billy, you made some, some excellent points there. Is, and, and I wanna address a couple of them is um, right now, yes, we're going through another one of these time periods. This cyclical nature time period, don't allow the media to distract you and, and, and confuse you over what's going on right now. Oh, this warming that's occurring on the earth, completely just human induced, nothing to worry about. We're just gonna fix things up, cool things down, we're, we'll be all set. Except mm -hmm. for the fact that we're right in line with another one of these cycles that I think is based on solar cycles um, that occur where you get extreme warming and then, and then a period of extreme cooling over mm -hmm. and over and over again. And in between each one of those events, you get a disaster. Now, yeah. how big that disaster is going to be is, depends on a lot of factors, especially if you have an ice age. And that's why I, I want to both remind people that that's why this, important is, this, this information is so important to learn right now because we're in this window where, where we have all of this available to us and we don't know how long that window is going to be. And secondly, thankfully, this is the part where I – go the positive direction um, on this discussion is that we don't have an ice age right now. And that's something that a lot of people, it gets past and they say, oh my God, these events that occurred back then, they're going to be just as bad right now. Well, they, they, they sort of can't be because without that ice age and having one to two miles of ice above where I'm sitting right now <laughs> talking to you, you you're not going to have that massive outburst of water that flooded, which is what was one of the major components, I believe, behind what they describe as being the Great Deluge. Now, mm -hmm. I do think that there is um, earthquake and, and um, volcanic activity that occurs as well. And I'm not going to um, poo-poo the idea that we're, we're not going to have challenges that are going to be coming up in our future. But we just have to understand and, and really look back at these events in history and then learn from them and try to figure out if we're going to go the same route that these ancient civilizations did and disappear, or if we're going to be able to stand the test of time and our civilization is going to continue. And so that's why we're at a crossroads right now, because we need to understand that the Maya, the Aztec, the Hopi, the Hindu, the Cherokee, and then many, many other ancient cultures around the world, they clearly state in their, in their ancient writings and between, in, in their stories, they say that, that human civilization today is, this is either the third or the fourth epic that, that we've had in our past. That means that human civilizations have gone through these cycles of rising up and then to being destroyed over and over again. And we're mm -hmm. at the third or fourth of those time periods. And that's pretty mind-blowing to, to, to wrap your head around and consider, I think, Billy, don't you? 
Oh, absolutely. It tells you that we're in a grand cycle, just like the, uh, the Indians talk about the native, you know, not the native American Indians, but the Indians in the East, when they're talking about these grand cycles of the yugas in the rise and fall of civilizations. Uh, and, you know, uh, the nature of this universe is cy cyclical and the rise and fall of civilizations is cyclical. And Thoth talks about this in the Emerald Tablets, where he talks about the fact that he's actually traveled to other planets to watch civilizations rise and fall. So we're not the only ones that go through this situation. According to Thoth, this happens all throughout the entire universe. Civilizations have this cyclical nature to them where they rise and fall. So we're not, you know, we're not the exception. The same thing happens here. Uh, and we're living, you brought up a very good point, we're living in a very small window uh, of opportunity here where we're able to uh, enjoy this planet, enjoy the beauty of nature, to flourish, uh, to, and, and, and really it's a shame when you see this tiny, when you can really understand how small this window is, it's, it's, it's smaller than a blink of an eye, it's quicker than a blink of an eye. Geologic time-wise, yeah. Geologically time-wise, yeah. So we're here and we're battling each other and fighting each other and we're pulling each other apart. We should be spending this little bit of precious time that we have to love each other, to have a show unconditional love to your brother and your sister, to unite, to make, you know, and maybe even to find a way if we join up to break this cycle or maybe, uh, you know, travel the stars and do things that we have an opportunity to do while we have this window of opportunity here before the next geological disaster. And it's not a, it's not to be negative. It's just that it's just part of life. Just like you, your avatar body is born and it grows up and it lives. And when it wears out, it passes on. Uh, you know, the same thing happens uh, you know, in, in these windows where you have uh, the uh, areas where air, the galactic space is clear of debris and planets can, can prosper and grow and develop life. And then there's times where that doesn't happen anymore for a short period of time. So we've got to be happy with what we have here. We've got to really start to love each other and enjoy the opportunity, this window of opportunity that we do have on this planet. Very well said. And that's essentially leading us into, well, how far back do we go? And, you know, if, if, if we had the cyclical nature of, of destruction over and over and over again, you know, are we going to make it to the next epic, to the next stage, like you said? Just imagine what the future of humanity could be. Thoth talks about that all the time. You know, what the potential of what we have is almost infinite. It's, it's, um, it's infinite, except that we are, are, are dramatically held back by all these things that distract us and keep us locked in this illusion of the material world. And that's why Thoth calls us, we're the children of men. We're not mm -hmm. men, we're not yeah. mankind, we're the children of men because we're all like these little kids that refuse to accept what we, who really, we really are and what defines the nature of reality. We, we get so distracted by this physical body, you know, this is me, this is me. I need mm -hmm. as much as I can before I die because I can't take it with me. Except mm -hmm. that we're just eternal conscious energy and you can't mm -hmm. take anything physical with you. Right. The only thing that matters is what you do during this life and what you leave behind in your legacy for the future. That's really all mm -hmm. that matters. And mm -hmm. so on that note, um, we're going to get into some of these really controversial topics because we're going to go back even further. And when, when we discuss in places like the Era to Genesis and Sumerian Kinglist, when it discusses how the first city was Eridu and then all these other cities emerged afterwards, people would scratch their head and be like, well, what else does it say, right? Is it, does it say anything else about what, what happened before that? What about, what about human civilizations? You know, I don't feel like a, an ape. You know, yeah. I, I really, I really this, everything in this life tells me that I'm something different from an ape. Well, evidence clearly states the opposite of what we've been told in school through this Darwinian evolution aspect of where we're told that Neanderthals and Denisovians came along and started slowly developing and then we broke away and then we had this rapid developing and then we ended up where we are. Except the problem is they don't explain at all how the human brain doubled in size in only a small time period or all these strange things about both why we have all these genetic abnormalities and you know we don't have hair on our body we, we if we mm -hmm. go on to nature and we try to try to survive in this world we will die it's almost like if you look at it from the outside like an observer it's like we're not really from here it's mm -hmm. like we're just here as visitors and stewards here to learn and grow whereas what we're told is that we're just sort of this ape that got here where we are because of survival yeah. of the fittest and because of that we can do whatever we want right billy Right, yeah, and that's, I totally don't agree with that. I believe that there's micro uh, changes of, you know, that, that uh, organisms are capable of, but the macro 
changes like what they've, you know, they're describing in this evolution to go from a monkey to a human being, it would take, I mean, probably billions of years. I mean, even just uh, a 2% variance, which is the difference between us and a chimpanzee, uh, that 2% variance literally takes multi-millions of years if they were to quote unquote be real uh, macro evolution. Uh, and so I really do believe after looking at the research, after analyzing information in biology, having to do with chromosome number two being fused in the human genome, uh, having the telomere caps put on the end of chromosome number two, and geneticists, mainstream geneticists have said, this had to be done in a laboratory. They said it out of their own mouths. They've written this down. This is like, you know, well known, but they can't t say who did it, but they can tell you it seems to happen around 200,000 years ago. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> Isn't that the same age we gave? If you add up all of the, the dates for the reigns of these cities, you get oh, just over 200,000 years ago, which would fall in line with the first city ever created in this whole, I, this whole biblical story with Adam and Eve and the mm -hmm. creation of man, right? Absolutely. <laughs> so you start to take these biblical stories, right, that we think are all just myth. And then you take the, these direct evidence from these cuneiform tablets. And then you take all this genetic data and you look at, uh, look at all of it on this holistic viewpoint. And all mm -hmm. of a sudden you start to see that the story of what we've been told about who we are is extremely antiquated, biased, and inaccurate. And I actually go one step further to say that it was deliberately chosen See, yeah. Darwin, if you look into Darwin and you look into his theories, he wrote confidently, he stated, it, and this is something that a lot of people don't bring up, is that mm -hmm. he expected that his theories were going to be disproved in the future. He, mm -hmm. he said that. He, he said, said that. He expected his theories to be disproved in the future because he saw holes in his logic. Mm -hmm. And he saw holes in what he was seeing around him, and he knew that. I, I, I know I really um, I hammer on Darwin pretty bad. But the, the more you look at it, the more you can actually see that Darwin didn't even, like I said, he didn't even think that his theories were going to be something that stood the test of time. But what happened is religion and other organizations grabbed onto Darwin because they mm -hmm. said, here is something we can use. Yeah. What happens if human beings could view their existence as an ape? You know what I mean, Billy? Mm -hmm. what, Absolutely. If someone, if someone perceives themselves as just an ape, and that yeah. brain is created, and that consciousness is created by the brain. Billy, I'm going to ask you, how would that change both what we do here and our perspective in the universe? Well, if somebody uh, thought that they really came from apes and that uh, consciousness comes from the brain, it would limit you um, because now you have a limited viewpoint of, uh, of where you came from and how you got to this point. I think that if you, um, that really locks you into the religious system. I think that if people would understand that we were uh, seated on this planet and then a little much later genetically modified maybe even again by these Anunnaki beings or these Atlantean beings at some point according to the ancient texts. But understanding that consciousness is not created in the brain, that consciousness is downloaded from the source. And I think that um, that would really expand people's uh, mentality to understand that they're a part of something much bigger than this simple evolutionary type of a fairy tale but they're really part of the God, the, the, the God divine energy that's flowing through the entire universe. And that the same divine energy that is creating everything that we consider to be matter in the third dimension and reality in the third dimension is the same divine energy flowing through and coursing through their veins. Uh, and, um, you know, there was a study, a scientific study done where they took people and they put them in rooms and they put them in dark rooms and they put these electrodes on their head, connected them to a computer. They want to see what people's uh, brain electronically look like on a computer after looking at specific images so they can see how the brain reacts to information and digital information and images. Well, they found out something amazing by accident. So they spaced these images 10 seconds apart. They would put up something like a serene image of a lake view or an ocean, a bed of roses, then a horrific scene like somebody getting murdered or stabbed or shot, and then a weird scene like kind of in the middle, like a building on fire and things like that. So all of a sudden what started happening is the data readout on the computer started uh, telling the computer what the next image was going to be up to seven seconds in advance. So that proves that we're getting a download of information from the future or from maybe real time, and we're not living in real time. So again, the brain doesn't create consciousness, it downloads it. Every case study they did, they worked out the same way. After a few minutes, the human brain was picking up the next image and transmitting it to the computer before the image showed up on the screen. Every case study they did. So this is how powerful we truly are. Our brain has billions of magnetic crystals. 
we download information directly from space time uh, and we bring it into our reality tunnel so that we can operate within it. Uh, but that's a whole other point of view that they don't really want us to know. They want us to keep us very locked in and, and, and focused on, you know, ape to human and 6,000 years and all this other kind of crazy stuff. But the true reality is we are much bigger and much more important than, some, than this evolutionary fairy tale that's been taught. That's right. And that's really well said, Billy. I could not agree more. Uh, what I wanted to say on, in regards to that is um, one of the examples I give that I talk about a lot is um, human beings right now perceive themselves as just this animal, right? Just this advanced animal. And it's like they're in this giant fenced in pen and they're all going to work and they're all doing what they're told. And they have, they live generally these very mundane lives. You know, we, we just come home, we watch TV, we, maybe mm -hmm. we go out for a hike every once in a while, we go out to do something, but largely our lives are very um, uneventful. And, and then before we die, that's why the regrets of most people is that they never really did anything, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, so those are, that's this farm of conformity that we talk about where people, the perception of reality that's been created here is not simply just based on some scientist that created it and oh, that's what all the evidence says, so we're going to go along with that. It's actually a paradigm to control our consciousness and mm -hmm. how we perceive reality here. Because we're about to read some cuneiform tablets that completely contradict what we're told, and you're going to see how this mindset could control human civilizations. So get, getting back before we start that, getting back to, I want to bring up a point, getting back to this farm of conformity. Um, those animals that are in that farm, doing what they're doing on a daily basis, going to some dead end job and wasting all their energy and time. And then they die and they wonder what they spend all their time doing. If those animals, and I, I use that animal as, that term animal as just a, an example because we're not really animals at all, are we? But if those animals realize that they're not farm animals at all and that they're actually this incredible being that doesn't belong caged at all, it belongs, you know, doesn't belong having its wings clipped. It belongs out ex expanding consciousness and reaching the infinite stars and all these things, whereas the complete opposite is happening right now. And, and when, those, when you discover the truth and when you read these ancient translations and tablets and when you look at all this data, it's like finding a hole in that fence and running away and never coming back ever again. But the challenge that I put to every single person here, and I bring this up in my previous book, the challenge, and it goes along with Plato's cave, that, that the idea that everyone's trapped by these illusions, is that you it, when you break out of that pen and you run away and the sun is basking on you and you're free, the challenge then becomes you have to come back. You mm -hmm. have to come back and save the rest of the animals that are in that farm or they're not going to make it out. And that collective of humanity is going to go down that road that other civilizations did and we're going to be wiped out and we're going to disappear and become a myth just like they did because we're not learning the fundamental lessons we need to right now to mm -hmm. make changes and reach the next level of our consciousness. So, so on that note, Billy, let's go into what actually says in these tablets and discusses it. Okay. And so, and so we're going to be starting with, um, we're going to be starting with what's called the Enuma Elish. And I know it's very dear to your heart, Billy, because it's one of the ones yeah. that I know you talk about um, among the most of all. And the Enuma Elish was found in the Ashurbanipal Library, as I mentioned, in 1849. Mm -hmm. And there's been many translations and different versions of it that have been brought up. And, and I want to also just mention before we bring that up that it may be amazing for some to read and understand that you'll, bring, you'll, you'll read one version of the Enuma Elish, and then you'll read another version, like the Babylonian version, you'll notice that they're different. Yeah. <laughs> what I just want to bring up is that there is a competition among these gods for who created mankind and who mm -hmm. can get credit for being their savior and their, and their fa great father. And so yeah. if you read Babylonian versions of what we're about to read right now, you find out that it says that Marduk created mankind. Okay. Right. And we're gonna, we can get into it and talk about that as well, but it's this competition for who can be the savior and who could be the, the, the great creator of, of our species. So in the version we're going to be reading, it's a version that came out of Nineveh, and it's the version that I feel is the most accurate. Um, and it's, it was translated by uh, great translators like Stephanie Daly and George Smith, some of the, some of the best that have been out there. Um, and so the Enuma Elish starts by saying, in, in this, from where we're going to begin, it says, they bound him, holding him before Ea. They inflicted the penalty on him and severed his blood vessels. From his blood, he, Ea, created mankind, on whom he imposed the service of the gods and set the gods free. 
And then it says, after the wise Eob had created mankind and had imposed the service of the gods upon them, that task is beyond comprehension. The gods were then divided. All the Anunnaki into upper and lower groups. He assigned 300 in the heavens to guard the decrees of Anu and appoint them as a guard. Chapter 6. Isn't that amazing? Oh, it's amazing, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it, it just tells you right there. And Billy, I'm sure you know that that same dis- description is almost um, referenced um, exactly in the Atrahasis as well. Isn't that, isn't that just mind-boggling with all these questions yeah. that people have? It's amazing that the Atrahasis epic and this have so many similar verses in them. So it tells you that it's, it's right on point. You know, it's really amazing. And, uh, and the thing that I like about the, the Enuma Elish is the fact that it mentions the Anunnaki, it mentions uh, Marduk or, or, or the Nibiru planet, and depending on the version that you're reading, and you can find Marduk in the modern day Bible. You can find him in the Torah. You can find these names in the American Library. So it's not even been hidden. It's there, but people have just never paid attention to it. Well, let's, let's try to have people understand they might not know these names. So Ea, that's mentioned directly in this translation that we read, mm-hmm. his name originally was known as Ea before he came here. And then he, his title was, was then changed to Enki. Okay, now, mm-hmm. so Enki, I'm just going to refer to him as Enki because that, that was his later, his later name. But Enki is the one that is credited in every single ancient text, except some of these other versions that were later re- re- rewritten, as being the creator of mankind. And he was, he was said to be this great being that created mankind to do the workload of the gods. And actually, the phrase I like even more, if you go read the Atrahasis, which those translations are in the stage of time, is it the, the phrase that it gives in the Atrahasis is even better. It says, they created mankind specifically for the role of the, to, to do the role of the gods, but it says the phrase, to undo the chain to set them free. Mm. Undo the chain to set them free. Now, mm-hmm. I want to tell you what I think about that, and then maybe you can mention what you think, Billy. Um, but but I, I believe that that references the chain of the physical reality in the third dimension and being mortal. I think mm-hmm. these beings used human, the human race as a way to achieve immortality and also probably to achieve a non-physical um, ex- existence here where they could go into upper dimensions and basically rule over us because we exist in a, in a lower state of awareness than they do. And, and, then I, and then you can chime in, but I want to also mention is that, well, who is Marduk? Because we brought that up. Marduk is credited as being the first son of, of Enki, Ea. And so this competition arose between these younger generation gods and the older generation gods over competing here on, on, on who could rewrite everything, who could become the savior, who could become the great, the great god here. And that's what this competition has been over and over and over again. And that's why Billy and I try to fight so hard to try to get the most accurate information because it's a, it's a battle of information and it's a battle of understanding the, the truth, right, Billy? Oh, it's the big battle. I mean, uh, you know, even I just made a post on Instagram about the fact that Marduk, also known as Amen Ra, is responsible for the defacing of a lot of these statues and these hieroglyphs around Egypt. And a lot of people got immediately offended and they're really going crazy on the comment feed. When I, when I get off of this, this show with you, I'm going to check my comments. It's going to be real hectic because people don't want to um, – uh, come to terms with the fact that this was done in deep antiquity. I've been to Egypt. I've seen the thousands upon thousands of defaced gods and when the hieroglyphs. I'm talking about temples with glyphs, probably I would say two, three hundred thousand glyphs in one temple, all chipped away. Faces of all of the uh, statues broken off. And these go way back further than Napoleon. You know, they want to say Napoleon went and shot the noses off and people were, didn't want people to know that there were some black people in Egypt. That's what, no. Amen Ra, also known as Marduk, is the one who had this done because why? Because he wants to be known as the, only, the one and true only God, the same term that actually made it into modern day Bible. Uh, you know, they had, these guys had big egos. I mean, big, big, big egos, man. Um, and they were battling each other consistently to be the one to do this and the one to do that. And matter of fact, if you look in the modern day Bible, look at the book of Deuteronomy, the book of Deuteronomy, and especially when you figure out that the word God in the Bible is mistranslated with God's singular, it's supposed to be God's plural, everywhere in the entire Bible. Yeah. It was purposefully done. In the book of Deuteronomy, you have these gods who are Marduk and his cousins and his nephews and everybody else fighting each other and sending humans across to another area where people have, they don't know, never met before, to battle them, to, to rob and rape and steal and everything else. These are the actual words used in the modern-day Bible, rape, kill, murder, 
uh, and course, right? and so forth, you know, and they were battling each other using humans as, as cattle, kind of like we do today. We take somebody out of school, we send them halfway around the world, we put them in the military, tell them to go blow up a guy on a camel so he can get a free education. But it's a mind trick we played on the people now. So they've got these gods doing the same thing today as they did in ancient times. Uh, but uh, it's really amazing how they wanted to be able to take claim for everything. And you see it passed down to the pharaohs. The pharaohs, they take claim for a tomb that wasn't theirs. They would take claim for a pyramid that they didn't really build. They take claim for anything because they want to have that, uh, they want to have that reputation that added to their bio. That you know? legacy, right? Yeah, that legacy is crazy. It's, and, and that's what it really comes down to. Um, and that legacy is what is being fought over right now. That, that, that battle has not ended. It's just, we don't perceive it the same way because our understanding of linear time um, is, is different than perhaps others. Um, yeah. We exist in a certain kind of 24-hour cycle based on this 12-hour clock. And it's really interesting to, if you look at the origins of where that came from and how that rules everything. How, because how we perceive time is how we perceive events and how we perceive the, um, how things go over the course of history. Um, and I want to bring up a couple little interesting points um, as we talk about human origins. Is that, And we really touched on that well when Billy was discussing how you know, we download consciousness or we're like antennas for consciousness and that we're really these beings that are here that didn't arise from just simply just an evolved state. Now, I do, I do believe that human beings are a product that includes um, a primitive um, ape, but that as like a blueprint, but that doesn't mm -hmm. mean that that's our complete origins. Um, if, let me give you an example. I think this is one of the best examples to really look at this, to disprove what, what has been taught. Billy brought up what's called micro versus macro. Micro means very small. Macro means larger. And so, and that's one of the things that I, I talk about in the stage of time a lot is that like P Lloyd Pye says, evolution, as we've been taught, is much more likely to be on a micro scale than on a macro scale, meaning that small things do happen over time based on the environments and things that occur. But mm -hmm. large things either take a really, really long time or they did not happen the way that we're told. And I think the same thing happened with humanity and the human race. Because if, if you look at how far back the human race goes and everything we've left behind in writings, everything we've left behind in observations throughout time, there's never been one mention ever of an ape that's been observed changing on a level that we can understand that would be related to evolution. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's apes that can be taught, gorillas and things that can be taught how to read certain things and, and certain intelligence because they do have an intelligence that can reach a certain level and that is rather intelligent, but it's nowhere on the same scale of what human consciousness and the, and the human brain is capable of on, or even on the same, the same level. Because when we look at human beings and the, the fact that we only have 46 chromosomes instead of the 48 that's found in most primates, mm -hmm. you really can see that there's been this gen genetic manipulation that's occurred over time. And I don't even think that that happened once. Bill, and I want your, your opinion, Billy, but it seems like if you read some of these stories and what they spoke about in these mm -hmm. tablets is that humans were becoming, were way too smart and way too conscious and mm -hmm. we were uh, potentially tampered with and, and then dumbed down, right? That's exactly right. I mean, I just talked about this at a lecture at Disclosure Fest in California a few months ago. The fact that our, our immediate cousins right behind us to me, were much smarter than us. Just based off of what I've read and researched, they were probably more, more, not maybe technologically smarter. That's potential. That's potentially they were, but I think that they were more smarter, smarter spiritually, more in tune with nature, more in tune with the Schumann resonant frequency of the earth. They were using the magnetite crystals in their brains. They may have even been telepathic. Uh, they may have had more DNA connected to the avatar system. Right now we have this quote unquote junk DNA, which is not really junk, it's disconnected. We've been disconnected from the higher realms and higher levels by these Anunnaki people uh, to, to keep us a little bit more dumbed down. Our brains, uh, our, our pineal glands are probably shrunk a little bit smaller than our, than our immediate cousins and making us into this homo sapien sapien uh, being right now that we're in this new biological avatar. Uh, they've got us in a way where they've kind of put a cap on us, literally. They put a cap on us physically with their telomere caps, and then they put a cap on us. Look, people who don't know what telomeres are, on the end of chromosome number two, scientists, geneticists discovered that chromosome number two was fused together, taken out, fused together, and a cap was put on each end, and these caps are like buffer material of genetic uh, information. 
So every time that your cells DNA replicate, then nothing gets lost in translation. However, these buffer caps run out of material. And what's interesting is when you go to the biblical account of the Tower of Babel, you discover that uh, human beings were working together on one accord to build this tower to the heavens. And whether it was a space tower, or whether it was a, a, a cargo cult type of a tower mimicking what the Anunnaki or these Atlantean people had built, or whether it was just a tower that they came together and decided to build this tower, doesn't really matter. What happens is Enlil, who's known as Yahweh in the modern day Bible, he, gets, he comes back and realizes the humans are getting too smart. They're getting too intelligent. I mean, this is crazy. He even says out of his own mouth, no matter what they set their mind to do, they can achieve it. So he says at that point, first he destroys the tower, then he says, my seed shall not abide in man forever. So we were living for a very, very long time back then. This is well documented, though. It's written about, oh, then a lot of ancient uh, civilizations talk about the fact that human beings were living for many hundreds and sometimes thousands of years. He said, my seed shall not abide in man forever. His years shall be 120. Well, Harvard scientists just recently, recently discovered two years ago that the, under the most pristine conditions, a human being can only live to 120 years, backing up ancient texts with modern science. And then they discovered these telomere caps, and they, they discovered how to stop the telomere caps from shrinking in mice. So they, uh, they then uh, uh, had mice living three times their normal lifespan with this new technique that they use on telomeres, which means that they can then now do it on human beings as well. So that the possibility for us to live for hundreds of years or even thousands of years is well within reach of modern science at this particular moment. But again, the scientists, you know, like I said earlier, were saying that they don't know who did this, but it happened about 200,000 years ago. This is all really coming together, the culmination of science, modern science backing up these ancient tablets adding more credence to what we're talking about and really adding right now, giving us the evidence that we need to talk about these topics and bring it to everybody out in the world. That's right. That was really well said, Billy. And I, I couldn't agree more. It's if you think of it as why would they want to, why would that need to be done? Right? So if you were, let's call you, you're, you an overlord of human civilization, if human beings could live for hundreds of years, if not more than a thousand years, think about how much knowledge you could obtain in that amount of time. Think yeah. about how much, how, how much fundamentally you could change and reach these higher states and all of this. So it was realized that, well, it'd be a lot easier to prevent that by just making so they, they would only die at a certain age, which mm -hmm. actually, if you look at the potential of what the Emerald Tablet says and the Sumerian King List and the others about how long even humans or other beings could potentially live, um, 120 years is, is like a little, it's like a yeah. little flick of your fingers is actually nothing if you look nothing. at it how far back time goes and these civil, how long these civilizations ruled for and all these things. And you brought up those great points is that here we have scientists that are verifying that these things occurred to our DNA a certain amount of years ago. And you're getting the same cuneiform tablets then back them up by not only saying that human civilization was created at the same time and then showing the, the long reigns of these great bloodline Kings proving that human beings also lived longer then you see the destruction of all of that and how we had to restart over again. And, and then the human lives became less and less over time to where we got now. Um, I think that you see all these shows where they talk about the telekinesis abilities of, of mm -hmm. certain special individuals and all of this stuff. And you read the Emerald tablets and a lot of this other, these ancient texts as well. And they all clearly state that human beings used to have all these gifts, yep. all these abilities and, and live a long time. And all of those things were taken away from us to prevent a lot of those um, changes that were occurring to keep us in this, um, this never ending loop of, of how I, what I feel is that we essentially live this life. We, we, we expel all the energy until we're done. And then we have mm -hmm. to do it all over again, over mm -hmm. and over and over again. And yep. that's that chain. I think that's that chain that, that they did that they that un, undid the chain to that allowed them to be free was essentially making us be the ones that do that that life that they used to have to do, mm -hmm. having to live another life again and do it all over again and have to grow up again and learn everything. They essentially achieved immortality and, and, and were able to rise above that, whereas we're stuck. Not only do we not know the truth, but we're kept in this paradigm as almost like mental slaves, wouldn't you say, Billy? Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, you hit it right on the head. We're literally trapped in this, uh, this spiritual cycle as well. You know? So once the avatar body uh, has broken down and, and dilapidated and, and decides to die, and then your spirit is released back into the universal consciousness, it then becomes recycled right back into the system again. 
uh, you know, and uh, the, the Anunnaki, these Atlantean people, they had discovered a way to, to surpass uh, this recycling. And they've also discovered a way to, you know, both talks about consciously incarnating at will. They also talked about having these avatar bodies on standby and regeneration chambers, which I'm sure Earth wasn't just the only place that they had one. They had one in the halls of Lamenti, which was discovered, I talked about it in my book, underneath the Great Pyramid. It extends about a mile out underneath the Giza Plateau. I told hundreds of rooms down there, exactly what those said they were, where they would put a body in and leave the body in there, a human body or avatar body, because it wasn't exactly a human, because he said that uh, while one body was, uh, was uh, ba basically being recharged, he would walk amongst men in another body, but walk amongst men, but unlike a man. So they were creating these avatars. And what have we now discovered in modern science? We can take literally a skin cell off of your body, we can then put it in a laboratory condition and turn that skin cell into a stem cell. Then we can grow that stem cell into an entire clone of you. And now with the technology we have, now that we have these um, uh, DNA hard drives and some of the technology being developed at DARPA and also at the 2045 project by Ray Kurzweil in, in, um, in Russia, we can transfer consciousness, like Thoth talks about transferring his consciousness into avatars. We can do it now in modern times. So in the future, it's potentially going to come to to be that you'll transfer your consciousness into an avatar body that came before from you die so before you die so and that so you can then transfer it over and then you can have that regain all that right exactly you do you don't lose anything you just go into another body uh and thoth says he had done this a uh, hundred times a hundred that's a hundred thousand years just imagine that they stop there for a second billy he says he's done that not a couple times mm -hmm. and not even a hundred times He's done it a thousand times. He's lived a thousand times and while his body recharged. It's crazy. <laughs> um, so we're talking about history that has, we have to completely try to readjust our understanding of how far back time goes and how far back all of this information goes. You know, we're living in this little glimpse of what used to be long ago. Um, and, I, and I think what you said is spot on. Um, one of the things I include in the stage of time is a, is a God chart at the end because uh it, it, including for thoth and i, I just wanted mm -hmm. to show that because we're talking yeah. about it um but in in here i included some question marks in sumer because mm -hmm. it's when you trace back thoth and you trace back some of these incarnation to like hermes and then long before you find out well how far back did these did these beings in, uh, incarnate you know who were they originally and yeah. you, do we have to completely look at all of these, um, what we perceived as gods, but also we perceived as these great leaders and these great wisdom bringers, we have to really um, relook at, you know, who are they? Are they maybe an incarnation of, of another great teacher from long ago? And I think, Billy, that is going to lead us perfectly into Atlantis. Because yes. when we we're talking about, we we're talking about this birthplace of civilization, okay? And I want to just lay that out there before we get into Atlantis so we can keep this timeline going. The Sumerian king lists in the era to Genesis, and along with all the other things we're talking about with the evidence from ice cores, they support that these civilizations were well over 10,000 years ago. In fact, if you, again, the Sumerian king list would support that they were more likely 200,000 years ago. And what is important about that is it gives us a time frame to then work with. So then after these civilizations emerged out of Mesopotamia, if you go with what the actual evidence says, it makes the most logical sense that then the grand civilization that was created that we think of as a global civilization was, was what was known as Atlantis. And that was this global maritime civilization that reached all the way around the world mm -hmm. and connected to, to all this evidence. And that's why you see so many common traits that we're going to go over uh, throughout the show all over the world. Now, so if Atlantis is the birth, birthplace of where this great global civilization emerged, then it would mean that it has the most amount of ancient wisdom of any civilization that's ever existed. Because it was around the, the longest amount of time with the most amount of knowledge that was freely available. Because as Billy has stated, this whole restarting of civilization um, and it's the battling of the gods, both second and first generation, meant that information was being fought over held, um, concealed, destroyed, um, uh, rewritten and tampered with to confuse everybody. So, but back then it wasn't like that. Back then that information was pure and that's what Thoth was trying to preserve. So it, so civilization that emerged out and became Atlantis, this great global civilization, its greatest priest was known as Thoth. 
And that's where all of this comes from. So Foth had all the knowledge of Atlantis. And he, because he was a master alchemist, he created what is known as the Emerald Tablets out of this indestructible material so that that knowledge that existed from the very beginning, describing everything from, from where it started, could be preserved. But not only that, is those teachings that could help us ascend to reach that higher level, that, that walkthrough guide for reaching the highest state you can, that's what this is. And so what Billy and I are going to be doing that's going to be special is we're going to be dual reading Emerald Tablet number one, which, which brings all of this in for the first time so we can understand the importance of where all of this came from. Okay, so I'm going to start. Emerald Tablet number one starts by saying, I, Thoth, the Atlantean, master of mysteries, keeper of records, mighty king, magician, living from generation to generation, being about to pass into the halls of Amenti, set down for the guidance of those who came from after, those records of the mighty wisdom of great Atlantis. In the great city of Kior, on the island of Umdal, in the great time far past, I began this incarnation, not as the little men of the present age did, the mighty ones of Atlantis live and die, but rather from eon to eon did they renew their life in the halls of Amenti, where the river of life flows eternally onward. A hundred times ten have I descended the dark way that led into light. And as many times have I ascended from the darkness into the light my strength and power renewed. Now for a time I descend, and the men of Chem shall know me no more. But in a time yet unborn I will rise again, mighty and potent, requiring an accounting of those left behind me. Then beware, O men of Chem, if ye have falsely betrayed my teaching, for I shall cast ye down from your high estate into the darkness of the caves from where ye hence came. Remember and heed my words, for surely I will return again and require of thee that which ye guard, even from beyond time and from beyond death will I return, rewarding or punishing, as ye have required your trust. Great were my people in the ancient days, great beyond the conception of the little people now around me. Knowing the wisdom of old, seeking far within the heart of infinity, knowledge that belonged to the earth's youth. Wise we were, with the wisdom of the children of light who dwelt among us. Strong were we with the power drawn from the eternal fire. And of all these, greatest among the children of men was my father, Thothme, keeper of the great temple, link between the children of light who dwelt within the temple and the races of men who in inhabited the ten islands. The dweller of Unal, speaker of the king to the kings, with the voice that must be obeyed. Grew right there from a child into manhood, being taught by my father the elder mysteries, until in the time grew within the fire of wisdom, until it burst into a consuming flame. Not desired I but the attainment of wisdom, until on a great day commanded, command came from the dweller of the temple that I be brought before him. Few there were among the children of men who had looked upon the mighty face and lived. For not as the sons of men are the children of light when they are the not to incarnate in the physical body. Chosen was I from the sons of men, taught by the dweller, so that his purpose might be fulfilled. Purpose is yet unborn in the womb of time. Long ago I dwelt in the temple, learning ever and yet ever more wisdom, until I, too, approached the light emitted from the great fire. Taught me he the path to Amenti, the underworld where the great king sits upon his throne of might, Deep I bowed in homage before the lords of life and the lord of death, receiving my gift, the key of life. Free was I of the halls of Amenti, bound not by death to the circle of life. Far to the stars I journey until space and time became the naught. Then having drunk deep of the cup of wisdom, I looked into the hearts of men, and there I found the great mysteries and was glad. For only in the search for truth could my soul be stilled, with the flame which within be quenched. Down through the ages I, I lived, seeing those around me taste of the cup of death and return again into the light of life. Amazing. It's, it's so powerful, Billy. Um, I want to just put my thoughts on that um, for, for a second, and then I want you to chime in and we'll just talk mm -hmm. about this for a minute. So to start, this, what, you just, what you just heard is part of tablet number one that was handed down as part of the Emerald Tablets of this ancient wisdom. Now, this wasn't being read, as you can tell, in Atlantis. It was being read in Egypt because mm -hmm. he, he talks about the men of Chem in it. That means that 
when Atlantis was being destroyed, Thoth and his trusty um, masons and priests and those who were around him, they all fled Atlantis, this island subcontinent that was considered this principal island subcontinent of seven circular islands with this large central landmass mass in the middle called Undal. Okay, and the, and the central city on Undal was known as Kior. And that's where Thoth says he was, he was born in this life. And, he, and then he was raised in, until he became a, a, a very wise priest. And so they, they fled Atlantis to create this new civilization in Egypt. And that's where he was essentially is reading and providing this knowledge to the men of Kem. But what I want to just bring up that I want you to talk about, Billy, that's amazing, is he talked about, he talked about how there was this connection that existed within these temples to these children of light with the children of men. And that only through these temples could they acquire this connection to essentially speak to the gods. So the Emerald Tablets is talking about how in Atlantis, these great priests in these temples basically had a connection to the gods, right? Yeah, I mean, they literally are talking. Now, these gods m might be these much more progenitor level uh, gods, uh, or maybe these uh, could be even people from, or entities from another dimension that were interacting with them and maybe even passing them knowledge. I mean, there's so much <laughs> that we just don't know. But uh, through these temples, and even like in the homes of Amenti, both would appear there and disappear from there. So uh, they could be uh, using these temples uh, in, inside of them at some point. There could be portals to other dimensions where they go before these grand gods or before these uh, other entities to get knowledge and information and esoteric wisdom. Yeah, and he calls them cycle masters. He's, and he says mm -hmm. in several occasions that he met some of these cycle masters. And in some of the other tablets, one of the things I find amazing is that he mentions how he was shown um, – the chaos that exists beyond our physical dimension and how mm -hmm. be, that there are these great masters that prevent all this darkness and evil from, from entering in. And that over time, some of those great masters um, are, were no longer present anymore to defend that. And that could be one of the reasons why so much darkness and evil was allowed into our realm is that these great protectors, these great priests, you know, these great um, men who would sit up on mountaintops and command their vibrational frequency into the universe, they were protecting this realm from evil. And they, those men don't, don't exist in the same capacity they used to anymore. And so that's why this torch he mentions that's being passed down to mm -hmm. then allow others to find truth is, is being given to us. Right, absolutely. And if you listen to what you just said, it's a perfect description of uh, Doctor Strange, the movie Doctor Strange, right. uh, where they were... Uh, it's the same exact story. I think they copied it from the Emerald Tablets, to be quite honest with you. The fact that they had to have these cycle masters and they had to be to, 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 to uh, ward off evil from attacking and destroying the planet and so forth. But some leaked in. It's the same story as the Emerald Tablets. They made it into a box office movie. That's right. And so you, you, you tend to see when you, when you review all this stuff and you go back and look at other movies and things, it all starts to make sense. And it really starts to blow your mind when mm -hmm. you can put all this together into a place where you can say – wow, this stuff is real and, and look, it's all around me. I just didn't notice it because I hadn't actually put those pieces together in like a chronological order based on the evidence. Because right. you can't just listen to what Billy and I are saying. You gotta go look at this stuff yourself. Go read the Emerald Tablets. Go see some of this wisdom. Ponder on its mysteries and decide for yourself what's real and what might just be an illusion. Mm -hmm. and, 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 that, and that's where we move to understanding, well, what happened next? So Atlantis was destroyed. And while it was being destroyed, Thoth and his, his trusted priests and masons, they left and they founded this civilization we know of as Kem in Egypt. And, this is, and Thoth says in that, that he was the great builder of these pyramids and that this was supposed to be a civilization that was arise to be in the image of Atlantis, right? Just like some other places mm -hmm. we're going to go into too. Yep. But, but Billy, talk about some of the ancient technology and some of the mysteries <laughs> we find from some of this lost Atlanteans um, yeah. that came and parted there, right? I'll tell you, it's amazing. I mean, the evidence there is just mind-blowing. Going to Egypt, I spent a lot of time there. Thankfully, I was able to do that. I was blessed to be able to do that uh, and to you know, go to almost every major temple in Egypt, had to get on a plane three times to fly to different areas to get out to these places, drive through the middle of the desert for hours to get to temples. And um, one thing you notice that is consistent, megalithic blocks, no mortar, uh, impossible cornering in the brick masonry, uh, magnetic granite, 
you know, this is all there. It's everywhere you go. And it points to, to one architect that, you know, and, and as you look around the planet, you see the same exact type of architecture, but again, points to one main architect. One person laid out this plan and said, look, this is the design plan, now duplicated everywhere, and that's how it was done. Uh, but what's really amazing is that the Great Pyramid at Giza, uh, the way that the structure is set up, you can just see the resonating energy and power from it. I had the, I had the, uh, the, the blessing to be able to go to some of the underground tunnels there, and that area used to be flooded with an aquifer in some of those parts. And then aquifer would allow physiostatic electricity to be transmitted up into the base of the Great Pyramid. And then from there, it would be shot up into the, through the Grand Gallery, which probably had resonating chambers in it, or resonating rods, that would then fire that, those, that power up into the King's Chamber, which I had the blessing of going into. Uh, and then I believe, personally, that the Ark of the Covenant used to sit inside that box that they try to call a sarcophagus. It's the, perfect, it's the same exact dimensions as the Ark of the Covenant. And that would interact with this arc, and that would create some type of a master spark, which then would be shot through the apex. Uh, and I believe that the Great Pyramid was a multifunctional stone, or is still a multifunctional stone computer, kind of now partly broken because the cap has been taken off and some of the technology has been taken out. But it, it, it operated as a wireless um, uh, generator, wireless power generator. It operated as a portal generator. Uh, it operated as a stabilizer because the Great Pyramid is directly at the center of the mass of the Earth, not the center of the Earth, the center of land mass of the earth, it's located directly on that spot. Uh, it also, to me, was a communications device. The way that the uh, shafts reach out to the Orion and the Sirius, I believe that those were, uh, they had a capability of sending some type of a subspace frequency to those star systems to communicate back and forth. Uh, you know, so it's just, it's just amazing. And then when you take a look at the Giza Plateau itself, I have a video on my YouTube channel about it, where the temples and the pyramids are located you can actually create a circular grid based off of the alignments and you get an exact alignment from the NASA inner or interplanetary star system and interplanetary system around our star and overlay it onto the, um, the grid map of the Giza plateau with the temples and the, and the pyramids and you get a perfect match. So it, the, the, the Giza plateau is a map of the inner planet star, uh, inner planets of our solar system close to our sun. I'm talking about Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars, those four, and our sun are mapped out right there at Giza on the plateau. Amazing, amazing it's logical knowledge. Basically, we're looking at a lost civilization with technology that was existing and it's now just these remnants and pieces that are left. And yeah. in, in what Billy said is, is, is spot on is that here we have these structures that we've been told how we're housing pharaohs. And that's what everyone is told in school and that's how they perceive the purpose of all these structures. Okay, yeah. They wanted to be remembered in the future, so they, they buried them there. And then, oh, look, that's their tomb. Yeah. Whereas when, when people, you know, that's, that's what we, we're, we're dealing with here is that there's a paradigm that's been created about ancient history and about our origins and about everything that we perceive in reality to, to create this certain doctrine here of, of what we think and what we follow. Whereas when you start looking at the evidence from the Great Pyramids, you, like Billy said, you look at the Great Pyramid of Giza and you say, there's never been a pharaoh ever found there, and there's not even ever been any hieroglyphs inside. In fact, mm -hmm. there's all this strange technology with these chambers pointing at different star systems and water being utilized underneath and all these secret tunnels connecting all mm -hmm. these specific points. And quickly, you get to, you get to realize, oh, wow, so this is, this is not a tomb at all. Then you factor in things like the fact that this is located right in the very center of the land masses of the earth and that... It's on these important ley lines, these convergence centers of energy, just like all the other structures all around the world that we're about to go over in a few minutes. You get to see that there was this giant grid system created here, this giant grid system created here, harnessing electromagnetic energy, and that these, these sophisticated cultures were likely, like Billy said, they may have been connected to all over the stars. We don't know how advanced the civilization was because the destruction that destroyed it was so severe that all that was literally all that was left of these civilizations are these megalithic structures they created and some of the stories and writings that were left behind to be carried on in the future everything else that existed was either buried or destroyed over time mm -hmm. and so that, that's what we're trying to put these clues and pieces together to these lost civilizations in human history that connect all the way back to human origins but that story does not end in egypt it does not end in chem 
because we have to understand that Egypt, the name itself, is a name that came later. And I want to point out, and I've mentioned it many times, is that we see a distinct difference in the sophistication and building of a lot of this advanced technology in Egypt, along with some later building of dynastic pharaohs, and I want to point that out. So when you go to a place like Karnak, and you have, a, you have these large blocks of things like travertine, and you can't find travertine more than a thousand miles away in Turkey, and you have these huge granite blocks like above the tomb of Osiris, which is not a real tomb at all. It's more of a physical, uh, a non-physical um, energy reincarnation tomb for a great being, Osiris, that I believe was connected to Enki. But anyway, when you start to look at that, and you look at those massive stone blocks that were quarried at the Aswan Quarry hundreds of miles away, it all starts to make sense to say, ah, oh, so these different distinct time periods occurred with these different mm -hmm. civilizations that then passed down knowledge to the next one that came. And then over time, every single time one of these civilizations came later, more and more knowledge was lost. And then before you know it, we lump them all together as just one civilization. And, and, and that's where a lot of this confusion comes in, right, Billy? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you hit it right on the head. I mean, literally what's happened is every time you move to another generation or another dynastic era, the, the, the technology gets worse, the construction gets worse. And that's a video that I had made, I guess, with some other guys on YouTube where they, they kind of gave me an impromptu interview. And I had said, I told them that the further back you go, the more perfect the construction and the closer you come to forward in time, the worse the construction. And I've seen that's the opposite we've been told, right? <laughs> exactly. I mean, how could that be? It gets more, how can it be perfect in the past in the deep antiquity and then be worse in the current day? Uh, and anybody who doesn't believe this, you just need to do one thing. Save up your money, fly to Egypt, land in Cairo, and look how the people live. Look at the buildings that they're living in and then go to the pyramids and you're going to go, oh my God, how we have fallen. I mean, they're living in buildings that are dilapidated uh, hand, hand mud brick condos. This is what they're living in. Like right now today in 2019, and then off in the distance, you have, this, you have this Giza Plateau, which looks like an advanced piece of technology left behind, uh, but still looks better than what they're living in. I mean, the evidence is there that the further back you go, it's just, it's just incredible. I went to Cambodia, uh, and as I got to Angkor Wat, Angkor Wat is still in amazing condition to this very day. But as you travel through, it was 500 hectares of land, so I went hiking 37 miles through the jungle when I was there in 120 degree heat. So obviously I was very motivated to see these locations. <laughs> I would say nobody, so. <laughs> nobody really wants to do that. But uh, as I got further in time to more recent temples that were built, guess what? They were dilapidated, they were falling apart. They weren't megalithic anymore. The stones were stones that I could pick up with my own hands if I put a little effort, effort into it. Uh, so the closer I got to, to, to our current era, the worse the construction, you know? And this is what you see in Egypt as well. That brilliantly said, and that's something that is echoed by a lot of researchers now that are not quite on the fringe that, of, of Billy and I, but that just, just speak about lost civilizations, you know, like Graham Hancock and Brian Forrester and Robert Schock and a lot of these other ones. They're saying, look, you can pinpoint all of these different places around the world from, you know, go from Pumapunka, go from Machu Picchu, go from all the way up through the Americas, Ushmal, mm -hmm. um, right up through Machu Picchu, um, and then up through Chichen Itza, you go through all the Americas, you find the same thing. And there's all this ancient, sophisticated building on the very bottom for whatever, was, whatever remained. And then the mm -hmm. top is all this less sophisticated, really primitive building. And mm -hmm. then when you take that model and you go around the world, you get to distinguish and you get to separate oh, all these different civilizations. This one came later. This one came earlier. And that's how we get to piece these pieces together. And part of that journey is then traveling around and going to see these anomalies around the world and deciding and, and, and doing research into them and figuring out, oh, okay, this is what legacy this, this piece belongs to and this is what this piece belongs to, okay? Now, where this journey is going to take us is when you read about Thoth in, in, in Kem, one of the things you find out is he was actually, either he left or he was, some even say he was kicked out by, by Amun Ra. Mm -hmm. and, and But regardless of which, which you believe, he definitely left Kem and he went to create these new civilizations of Atlantis around the world. And he went to two key locations, in my opinion, that I see evidence on, and that is um, the area of the United States, Mexico, and South America. Those areas have this heavy influence of this, these builders and this rise of civilization that seems to have come out of nowhere. 
um, I want to just bring up in, 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 in Puebla, Mexico, down near um, Teotihuacan and Tenochtitlan, that, that area of, of Mexico that's near Mexico City, there, um, archaeologists have done digs in some of those areas, and they've found evidence that shows um, sophisticated civilizations lived there well over 100,000 years ago. So we're looking at these time periods that to completely rewrite the narrative of what we think. There may have been civilizations that were destroyed even before these. There could have been time periods where other people existed there because that's what these say. I want to bring up, um, it, go to that incredible Mayan temple site of Ushmal, okay? This is probably the best example I can pick out. Um, in, in the Mesoamerica, in the Mexico, Mesoamerica area, showing this, what we're talking about right now. The name Ushmal means built three times, okay? And I want people to look that up because it's totally mind-blowing, is that the very name means that. And the temple there, the, the largest temple, is called Temple of the Wizards. Just like, if you remember the Emerald Tablet when we read of Thoth, he says he's the great master of mysteries and the great magician and the wizard. That's, that's what he's referenced as. Mm -hmm. And so you see these common examples and these influences all around the world of these sites where they, they traveled around and created these civilizations. Right, Billy? Absolutely. I mean, you're, you, again, you're right, man. You're, you're a great researcher, man. Right. Uh, I went to Teotihuacan, Mexico. Uh, I had the blessing to be able to go to Thoth's house, Kukulcan, Coach, whatever you want to call him, he's got a million names, as you know. But it was his house where it's still there. It's still there. He actually lived on this on site. And one thing I want to point out is a lot of uh, people might get offended by this in a way when they've learned this. But if they go research it, they'll find it is true. The Mayans did not build Teotihuacan. I'll say that again. The Mayans did not build Teotihuacan. And where did I get this from? From a homegrown archaeologist in Teotihuacan. <laughs> It's actually taught there in schools. It's actually taught there in Mexico that the Mayans did not build it, neither did the Aztecs. The Teotihuacans were there much uh, further back than the Mayans. The Mayans kind of inherited what was already there and some of the wisdom and teaching that were left behind, but they didn't build it. Uh, and then uh, there was a volcanic eruption much later, a couple hundred years later, in a valley, and the Aztec people had to migrate out of that area because their whole uh, city or their, where their living area was destroyed, and they stumbled across Teotihuacan, and they inherited it as well. Okay, so this is why you have a situation where you see advanced technology, advanced building uh, techniques being used, and then you have these people that are still, uh, you know, uh, killing, killing and cop cutting people's heads off and cutting their hearts out to give to the gods and sacrificing virgins and all this. You're going, wait a minute, how can you be this technologically advanced but then you're doing all these uh, sacrificial things and all this other stuff that didn't really make any sense. It's because they were almost like a cargo cult in a way, and they were trying to bring the gods back, just like you know we've done here on Earth in modern times with the, the people from Bikini Atoll and stuff like that. So uh, it's really amazing. I mean, these, these, uh, these Anunnaki, Atlantean people, whatever you want to call them, they really made their way around this entire planet. They influenced so many civilizations. And when both left out of Africa, and came to uh, Mesoamerica and kickstarted the civilizations here, they built this super advanced civilization. When I went to Mexico City, there were literally hundreds of hills in Mexico City. So we're talking with the archaeologist and the driver, who's also a researcher, and he's pointing at all the hills. And he's saying, you see this hill, you see that hill, you see that hill. I'm like, yeah, what's up with all these hills? He goes, every hill is a pyramid. Underneath the street, underneath the tar, underneath everything, underneath the church. So what they did was, he said in ancient times, they blew up, not ancient times, sorry, in more recent times, the Spaniards blew up the tops of the pyramids and then put churches on top of them. Uh, and so Catholic churches. So unfortunately, that's what's happened. But if you were to go and dig up every one of those hills, you're going to find literally hundreds of pyramids just in that one area. So it's really amazing and astounding what was accomplished down there. Uh, and I wish I could just get in the time machine, man, and go back. But um, that, that area, that whole entire region was highly sophisticated. And at Teotihuacan, Teotihuacan, uh, if you really take a good look at it, it really looks like an advanced spaceport to me. I can envision uh, some type of launch tower. Those, those shorter platforms look like launch towers where you would put a, a vehicle up to that would just kind of sit there on a the pad waiting to take off. Just in my personal opinion, that's what it looks like. Uh, and then you have um, the Pyramid of the Sun and Pyramid of the Moon, which are actually 
fractalized pyramids. They're pyramids on top of pyramids on top of pyramids. And the pyramid of the sun is built on top of what? An aquifer, just like the one in, Great, in Giza. And the pyramid of the sun has the same exact size base and is exactly 50% the height of the pyramid of Giza. That doesn't happen by accident. That was done on purpose. You have the same, again, you have the same architect then duplicating these, uh, this, this technique over here in Mesoamerica and helping to kickstart the civilization long before the Mayans arrived. Exactly. There's a, there's a certain type of signature of the size of the block ratio. It's like a 52 cubit block that is used. You see the same type of building. And I know that a lot of people, it's like they constantly share those images of, of pyramids across the world. And they say, you know, are they connected? Are they, are they um, somehow influenced by similar places? And it's amazing to me how much of our society, because of the whole indoctrinated system of what they've been made to believe and how they don't want to be out of the mainstream, they'll choose to ignore that. They'll just say, oh, that's just a coincidence. It doesn't really matter. Because what happens when you start to dwell, delve into this is you go down this long road of having to completely reorganize your thoughts and, and how you perceive the past. So Billy brought up some, some great, great points there, Billy. Well said is that in all of these ancient sites, whether it's Mayan or Aztec or, or um, down in throughout Peru and down in um, Viracocha's area of um, Pumapuku, you find that all of those ancient cultures, like you said, when you ask them who built these structures and where they came from, they all state that they found them there and that mm -hmm. they were built by those, their ans those, those, those ancestors that they once um, revered and looked up to. And so what we think of as the Aztec, Aztec, Maya, and Inca are just these remnants of those civilizations from long ago and what's left over. And just, so just imagine it, right? Instead of these cultures we perceive now, their, their ancestors, instead of us perceiving them as building them, their those structures, like Billy said, imagine them just like we were when we first <laughs> rediscovered these in the jungle. You know, we're emerging through the brush and we open up this scene and we see this temple out in the jungle and it's all mm -hmm. destroyed and there's, it's strewn everywhere and there's just pieces of it. And this culture is amazed by it and they start poking around through the ruins and they find these ancient writings and they're reading about them and they're blown away because there's all this knowledge that completely changes and what happened this civilization all of a sudden becomes jump-started because they have all this knowledge and wisdom so mm -hmm. they try to emanate what was there before they try to rebuild it they try to connect with these gods because they learn through these writings they learn that these Long ago, they were influenced by, by things that are no longer there anymore, by great beings that were great builders. So what do they try to do? They try to do blood sacrifice and all these awful techniques to try to get the gods to come back because they're desperate. And that's where all this confusion comes in. Mm -hmm. It was out of corruption and desperation that a lot of those cultures did that, not because they were influenced by their original wisdom bringers to do that. Um, and that's, so those are some of the misconceptions that we, we got to get past here. But what, what this brings up, and what's on the screen is what we're looking at is South America. Um, and we're looking at the Andes Mountains in the background. And you're looking at Lake Titicaca, which is a, an amazing, amazing place. The, the highest navigable lake in the world over a thousand feet deep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which is really interesting if you start to look at the, the stories of Viracocha and how some of them claim that this great creator being came out of the depths of, of Lake Titicaca. And when you think about how, the underworld and the Abzu, this lower world is connected through these deep portals underground and caves mm -hmm. and underwater. It starts to make sense and it makes, starts to scratch your head and wonder about the significance of what Lake Titicaca plays. Well, anyway, on, along the shores of Lake Titicaca, which is in Bolivia, South America, all over the place you find these strewn ruins of ancient civilizations, Pumupunku, Tiwanaku. And like Billy said, they didn't call themselves what we think they call themselves. They said that they were the, their ancestors were called um, the Tiwanakus, and mm -hmm. some of them called themselves the Viracocians. So th these aren't even terms that reference the Inca. They're these long ago terms that we don't even use anymore. But when we start to look at the evidence from that region to try to connect it, to say, okay, what's the evidence that actually proves that these civilizations are connected? You know, give me something out that's not just circumstantial. Well, go look up the Fuente Magna Bowl. It'll completely blow your mind. And that's what I have on the screen right now, the image. So a little backstory so people know what that means is in 1958, next to Lake Titicaca, where all these ancient ruins are, go look up Pumapunku. 
some of the strangest ruins on the entire planet. Near that same area where all that advanced technology is already from these ancient Viracocians, you find there was this there was this field that a farmer was plowing in nineteen in 1958, and all of a sudden his plow hit the edge of something. So he gets out and he goes down in his field and he picks up this artifact, and it's this very strange bowl. Okay, now some ex, some academics will tell you that this is all fabricated and it's not real, just like a lot of this stuff we're going into to try to make people think that all of this is is just a some fantasy and that what we're, what we're told is the correct story. Whereas if you go do research, you can clearly see that all of this stuff is real and it's all just there if people know where to look. So this farmer finds this bowl and he picks it up and he wipes away the dirt inside and he finds these ancient inscriptions and he doesn't recognize it at all. It's not something he's ever seen before. So he brings it into this, to the, some of the experts in the area and he has it sent away and they determine that it's cuneiform writing. Now, if you look at the similarities of it, you find the same etch marks. And like Billy knows, they still create cuneiform today. And you can see those etch marks are almost exactly mirrored, mirrored in, this, in, in this bowl. And, and Billy said, well, they say it's some kind of a proto-cuneiform um, Sumerian writing. But what does that even matter? It still means yeah. <laughs> that the same writing is connected all the way across the world. Right, Billy? Absolutely. I mean, this doesn't happen by accident. There's no sense of coincidence here. This is actual uh, something that evidence of somebody teaching people in different parts of the world the same exact writing techniques with the same exact type of a stylus and the same exact type of a clay, uh, wet clay uh, system. Uh, and uh, like I said earlier, before we got on the air, was um, Mr. Finkel at the uh, British Museum has a great little video, very short video on, uh, on YouTube where he actually takes a stylus and he impresses into it wet clay and begins to do the cuneiform writing. Uh, and it's very tedious to just make a one name or one word or one phrase. That's why I think that these cuneiform tablets are so important because you've got some information here and we've got millions of these tablets now that have been discovered around the world, but we've got information that somebody took their tedious time and effort to create and write and then bake and put it on in a way that it can withstand the test of time. And I think when somebody goes to that level of effort to put information out, it's well worth our research and investigation to look into it because it's like a time capsule. It was yeah. put here for us in this current era to read it, decipher it, and to realize the true history of our ancient past, what went on the, in the ancient past. And it's really an amazing window that's been open for us to figure out what happened back then because the past is prologue. So we can analyze this, this information from around the world, all these cuneiform tablets, these bowls, these artifacts being discovered, these megalithic structures, and we can analyze all these stories from all this, these Sumerian cylinder scrolls and everything else that we've discovered now and figure out how can we prevent this from happening in the future? How can we curve this cyclical nature of, of rise and fall of civilization? Can we stop this cycle from rising and falling? Can we get to the next level? Can we become a type, uh, type one, type two, type three level civilization and harness the power of our star and prevent uh, galactic collisions with asteroids and comets. Love it. Exactly. You know, so can we get to those levels? And I think what we're doing, me and you, Matt, I think that it's so crucial because it's like we're really the pioneers of bringing knowledge and information to the general population, which is going to spread like wildfire and maybe, just maybe, giving us an opportunity as a civilization to bypass this cycle of rise and fall and get to the next level as a civilization. Well said. And and uh, like, like Billy mentioned, um, what we're trying to do right now is not just being done by so many other people. Most mainstream academics and researchers are scared to even go into this idea of trying to decipher these ancient translations and texts. And that's why if you look at almost all these researchers, they'll delve into ancient megalithic stuff because that's, that's pretty easy to see now. We, we really can know what that is. But a lot of this other stuff, because it connects to this idea of beings, entities, aliens, some kind of gods, all that stuff, it's off limits. And so most of them, because of credibility reasons and because of how controlled this information is, most aren't willing to connect those pieces. So that's why Billy and I are doing the best we can to not only preserve this ancient wisdom so it can last, test, last the test of time, but also to make sure that others can, can understand what those teachings said and what they left behind long ago. Now, and what did they leave behind? Well, they left behind these amazing structures. And this is Saskia Human outside of um, Cusco. And I know Billy has been to this one. 
But when you, when you look at something like this, um, it almost seems like this technology that exists in South America is in many ways even more perfect than I've seen anywhere around the world. Like they perfected it here. And what was that some kind of a, did they melt these rocks and then reform them? And that's why they have these bizarre shapes. And so what, let me get your take on some of these incredible um, structures around the world. Man, this is just amazing. I mean, even seeing this again, I was there. So, you know, it's just, a, <laughs> I'm so happy, man. You know, you know, the way that I've been able to, to live my life. I mean, I've been there. I've touched those stones right where that gentleman is standing. I've took a picture right there. Um, and uh, even the archaeologist that was there with us that we hired was saying that, you know, <laughs> The gods built this. And I mean, you still can't put a human hair in between some of these blocks. Uh, they withstood earthquakes, uh, you know, di disasters, storms, everything else you could think of. And they're still there and they're still rock. I mean, they're locked solid together. And it, it almost looks like some type of a, a heating tool or a heating laser or something just molded them together. But you're not gonna go to a rock quarry, cut rock, and then bring it to a location hundreds of miles away just to make these intricate cuts, when you could just stack the blocks and make simple square blocks, you don't need to make these intricate cuts. Uh, these intricate cuts are so amazing, it just, it just leads you to, to believe that it's gotta be some type of advanced technology, something that molded and bent these rocks and glued them together in a way, it's almost like they're hermetically sealed in a way. I mean, they're yeah. really locked together. They can't, you can't just like pry one of these blocks away, it's not that easy. Uh, and the fact that we can't really duplicate this today it leads us, you know, it just adds more credence to, to, to the fact that these people had some advanced technology, whether it was a harmonic frequency yeah. tools, cymatic tools, um, you know, because because cymatics, the right frequency can generate heat. Did they use a frequency tool to, to, um, to mold these bricks together, these blocks together? Whatever it was, and also they, they designed them also in a way that, that made them earthquake proof, so they actually have the capability in certain areas of sliding and moving with the vibrations of the earth. This really amazing. This was a great fort, and the top was a great uh, temple. Which yeah. the temple it didn't it did not stand the test of time. Uh, the walls are there, but the top's missing. But this is just an amazing place. Yeah, and it's, now notice, Billy, what the design of the blocks almost looks like. To me, it looks like a honeycomb design. When you say it has oh, this yeah. type of honeycomb design, and, and so what was the purpose of that, right? Like, why would you want to design them just like this with these knobs sticking out in some spots and these really strange angles? And I think what you said nails it on the head. I think that those were designed in a certain way to act as a harmonic frequency so that it's like a, like a tuning fork. Mm -hmm. Dings. And so it can have this certain type of harmonic frequency because like Billy said, there was a big temple sitting up there. And so you had to create this certain kind of energy connection with that temple. And that's what it was all about back then. We find yeah. these sites when you, when you look at a world map, you know, go search really quick on Google and go look up ley lines of the earth and then go look up ley lines of the earth and the, megalith and the location of megalithic sites around the world. And boom, they line up almost perfectly. And mm -hmm. quickly you can see that, wow. So not only did these advanced civilizations know about that, and first of all, how did they know about the convergence of energy lines around our planet? I mean, that is almost mind-blowing for us to even consider now. And we're circumnavigating the globe with GPS units and compasses and everything all over the place. And yet these, these civilizations knew in many ways what we don't even know now anymore at all. They had mm -hmm. knowledge about energy and consciousness and the cosmos that we're, we're just starting to piece together and get back today. But this legacy all around the world, you can really see it and you can really see how, what happened? Well, there were these lost civilizations after Atlantis that spread around the world and then these destructive events occurred that ended the last ice age. And that is the most key point I want to leave behind. These events are what ended the ice age. They're not just coinciding with the end of the ice age. There was a, a massive ice age, for those who don't know, where I am, the Laurentide ice sheet, miles deep. I mean, if you were to try to put, try to envision something like the Empire State Building or any of these large buildings around the world, that wouldn't even come close to the depth of this ice. Mm -hmm. So if you had ice ages covering the world and then those ice ages, those, that ice rapidly melts and you get these global tectonic shifts and earthquakes and tsunamis and sun coming in on coral mass ejections and like burning structures and causing vitrification on it. When you're seeing all that evidence around the world, it paints this picture 
of these cataclysms that were so disastrous that they're like something out of some Hollywood movie that we can't even imagine today because they were so, so um, severe that they wiped out all of these civilizations around the world to where I think that there was only a few elders that remained. And they, those elders tried to jumpstart civilization in other places, but over time that was unsuccessful. And eventually we, we almost went back to the stone age basically, right, Billy? Absolutely. That's right. That's exactly what happened. We literally uh, had lost all of the knowledge, all the wisdom, uh, the, the, uh, the verbal history uh, had been passed down. But as you go through, you know, use, utilizing verbal history and passing that down generations, you begin to lose uh, some of the information over time. And so generation after generation, it became less and less important as survival became more important. Uh, and just like today, we all use cell phones. I use a cell phone, you use a cell phone. But if civilization was to collapse right now, uh, I don't know how to make a cell phone. Uh, you know, so I know some of the parts work, but I don't know how to actually physically make a cell phone and rebuild the towers to make the cell phones communicate the microwave signals and so forth. It's a lot of collaboration to get all that back up. So when something collapses like that, even if you have a few wise people, it's not just like, well, they knew about it. How can we can't kickstart it again? Well, it takes a lot of collaboration and a lot of people knowing little different parts and working together to rebuild a high level of civilization. It's just typically can't be done with two or three wise men. You got to have quite a, quite a bit of people on the same level uh, and working together in unison. Uh, but, but survival took hold and, you know, it became a priority. Information just became, you know, that type of knowledge became less and less important as people were just trying to make it through the day. Yeah. And so you, so if you, you can imagine back then those original builders, maybe they returned to some of those civilizations after and they try to impart that wisdom again, but then they leave and they move on somewhere else. And so over time, maybe you, you would see, like we see with this building, you would see mm -hmm. a blossoming for a short period of time where they would try to restart that civilization and reach that sophistication. But mm -hmm. then without guidance, without those teachers around, that civilization would end up becoming corrupted and it would fall down into these lower moral codes of blood sacrifice and war and all these things we find today, which is mm -hmm. actually echoed even in our civilization now. It seems like there's this eventual downfall of situations, civilizations where they often become corrupted if they're not given guidance and wisdom to um, follow a certain path. And so we're moving to the last location today on our journey. And this is what I consider the very heart of the Aztec empire, okay? This is Teotihuacan, and this is uh, an ancient Aztec city, which, and like Billy mentioned, if you go around the world, okay, go to any of these megalithic sites, one of the common things you find is that their largest pyramids are almost always named the Pyramid of the Sun and the Pyramid of the Moon which is fascinating because yet again provides this connection with, with how they thought back then and, and the purpose behind why they were building these structures. I mean, mm -hmm. this, this, this area that you have is literally what was attempted to try to create a new Atlantis. How, what, what's some of the evidence to back that up? Right next to this site is a place called Tula, Mexico, where you have these massive statues of these huge guards and they're called the Atlantean warriors. And I bring that up every time because they're specifically called that as part of the ancient wisdom. That's not a name that was given to them later, but it proves to you, it shows that that was the whole purpose was they were trying to create these new Atlantean civilizations mm -hmm. and that those pieces, whether you want to talk about the Olmec, whether you want to talk about the Aztec, the Maya, the Inca, the Viracocians, and many, many other branches of that. They're all just this part of this lost history that we're just trying to put the pieces back together today, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, Thoth came here. Uh, his name changed many times while he was in Mesoamerica. I mean, you know, he's been everybody. <laughs> Kukukan, Quetzalcoatl. Ver Quetzalcoatl, Veracocha. He might have even been Lord Pakal. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's a good point. Right. And I've been to Tula, Mexico. I've been to the Atlantean statues, took pictures next to them. And they're holding technology in their hands. They've got on what looked like to be some type of sophisticated suit or outfit with, with uh, uh, what looks like a, uh, a container or something on the chest and on the back. They have handbags, right? They have the handbags. Yep. On, some of them look like they're holding, might be even holding a weapon in a way, the way it's, they're set up. I'm going to send you my photos. It's really okay. amazing stuff. But um, I've been to, to, to Tula at the top of the Pyramid of Kukulkan there. I've been to... Uh, uh, right down from there, I went to this other place called, uh, 
Kuka Wamilpa, Kaka Wamilpa. It's a very strange name. It's a mountain there. And they take you on a tour inside this mountain. And you go, we went down about, uh, uh, man, maybe uh, two kilometers. And about 90 meters up from the floor, I took a video of an Egyptian head carved into the inside of this mountain on the inside of this uh, cave that we, this gigantic cave system we were in. And the cave just kept going. Uh, but in there, it's carved in a way, again, using highly advanced technology. And somebody in ancient times was utilized, utilizing that cave as a kingdom. You can tell by the way it's set up. Uh, the, the strange thing, though, is the further you go, the less oxygen you get. And it just kept on going. I mean, it kept going and going and going. And you had to, it, all the tourists had to loop around because the, the oxygen becomes more thin down there. And you can't, you know, somebody's going to start passing out. But down there is evidence of advanced technology. I wish I could have kept going with some oxygen masks on just to see how far I can go and really tap into some stuff that they probably didn't cover up. That they didn't take down that one Egyptian uh, motif, that Egyptian head sticking out of the, out of the uh, inside of the cave up there. But this whole area is full of nothing but amazing things. Just looking at this, this image you have on the screen now, like I said before when I was talking earlier, these look like launch pads to me. I mean, just to me. I could be wrong, but they kind of resemble launch pads. I've climbed up on top of these structures in front of the Pyramid of the Sun, uh, right along the Avenue of the Dead. And uh, I have videos of me on Facebook on top of these structures and everything else. And they really look like um, something would mount up to them and be like they were there to hold something. And then people would walk up these stairs to get into whatever that thing was in the ancient times. Another thing that's amazing is that this entire place is connected by these underground tunnels but they're not really tunnels. They're really carved uh, pathways in the shape of a perfect square almost. And inside of them, they discovered tons of mica. Now, mica is a technological purpose, uh, is technologically used for the purpose of insulation in modern times. So they found tons of insulation underneath this pyramidal structure here at Teotihuacan um, that connected the pyramids together and all the structures together. Uh, and to me, it lends to me evidence that there may have been some type of electricity flowing through this underground tunnel system. Those tunnels, the way that they're cut so perfectly and geometrically shaped, to me, lends credibility to the fact that they may have been more technological. Yeah, I, I definitely you know? agree. It, yeah. You see that mica and you find um, that they were using that as like a technology means, not like we use it today. All those were used to focus energy or mm -hmm. use these as some kind of energy some kind of a temple that would have a certain harmonic frequency it's basically just lost technology that we're trying to figure out today and trying to yeah. wrap our heads around but i want to just bring something up at the end of this that i think is, is pretty amazing is that those atlantean warriors those statues that, that that are standing there in, in tula mexico mm -hmm. um probably another piece of evidence that i want to i want to bring up that i think is the probably the biggest one of all that connects all of this the, probably the best piece of evidence of all is that that handbag design that you find in the Olmec, okay, and in those, in those Atlantean warriors in Tula, in different locations in Mexico, okay, you see that handbag design. You find that handbag design also in South America. You find that handbag design all throughout um, Mesopotamia, through um, all the ancient world and these ancient civilizations. Now, mm -hmm. in, in Gobekli Tepe, you found that you find those same handbags on the T-shaped um, pillars they have. So yeah. what is that, right? In the stage of yeah. time, I talked about that, and I really laid that out, and I showed some pictures and examples. In my personal opinion, I think that the handbags represented this passing along of knowledge and technology, where a, a bag is, 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 a, is a symbolic way to represent something that holds something, something mm -hmm. that carries something to be passed on. So when you, when you have, and they show different groups of them too. And I think mm -hmm. those all might have little meanings too, and how many of them they show next to each other. But the fact is that handbag design has been seen in each of these megalithic ancient civilization areas all over the world. And I yeah. think those are what link this influence of these ancestors that traveled around and gave them all that technology. The handbags are showing that they provided all of this sophistication and wisdom and they passed it on to them and then created all these grand civilizations and then they were destroyed. And now, of course, we're trying to put those pieces back together today. Right, Billy? 
Yeah, the handbags are definitely uh, one of my biggest posts that I've, you know, I've made many times over and over. I repost. Yeah, what, do you, what do you think about them? I want to get your, one of your thoughts too. That's a very interesting concept you came up with, the passing on of knowledge. Uh, I made a video. Tools and like sophistication and all that. Yeah, yeah, I made a, I, yeah exactly. I made a, a, a video with uh, Thomas uh, Jensen uh, out of um, Denmark a few years back about the bags where, because I just, one day I was looking at um, some old NASA footage and I was trying to just analyze this whole moon thing and the launches and everything else. And I saw the astronauts come out with the bags, the handbags. They were life support bags. And so I started going, wait a minute. So I've gone from, I went from the Mercury, Apollo, I kept going for, forward all the way to the STS missions. Now, no matter what mission I went to, I saw that they were coming out with these handbags that were connected to a tube that were connected to their spacesuit as they climbed up uh, into the uh, launch tower. Like, like Laura Bacall, right? Yeah, like Laura Bacall. That so, image that shows yeah. in him of the Mayan site. Yeah, exactly. So I started saying maybe it's a possibility. I mean, we don't know. We're all speculating here. But it's a possibility that those, these bags could be life support bags, uh, you know, adding credence to the fact that these beings were getting in ships and taking off a lot uh, or, and flying around the planet as well, or maybe needing acclimation to the atmosphere or whatever. I don't know. But uh, your, your uh, theory also is very, very interesting, and it's possible that it could be a little bit of both. It could be technology combined with knowledge and wisdom. Uh, but the thing, the one thing that we do have in common is the fact that they've been found all over the entire planet. They're like, they're like a signature, right? They're like a signature of those, those uh, call them whiz, wisdom bringers, influencers mm -hmm. of the past, right? That's right. It links the whole world together, and it proves that they were a global civilization, and, you know, there's no more question. You, you can't question it at this point when you find those bags literally have been found on um, little artifacts all over the world. Yeah, so it, sh it, it basically, it gives us the idea of, okay, so you find this megalithic precise building, there's, there's one. So, okay, that, so that's probably a lost civilization. And then you find the handbags. You, can, you, you put both of those pieces together mm -hmm. and you, get, you have a blueprint to then follow around the world and try to figure things out. Um, yeah. and I, and I want to, I just want to, I want to say that, um, it's really an honor to be able to work with you on this, Billy, because you and I have such similar research, um, areas that we've studied and, and the, and the, the concepts and the hypothesis that we've come up with is so similar that mm -hmm. it's, it's almost uncanny actually, when you say, yeah, I know. I, I, I mean, it really is. It's, it's incredible, man. It's like we're kindred spirits. We've been researching along the same path. Uh, even separately. And when we come together, I get confirmation from you and you get confirmation from me. So right. it's really good to interact like this because I'm like, wow, you know, so the path that I was researching, because, you know, researching is not an easy thing. Um, a lot of people will just do a couple of Google searches, but that's not what we do. <laughs> they have no idea. We spend countless hours, man, mm -hmm. through texts and tablets and PDF files and, and everything else and, you know, uh, and trying to piece together this puzzle. So yeah. that paint a picture for people to look at not that it's the exact correct picture but it's as close to the best that we can do to help you get an idea of what what really happened back then and uh it takes us a lot of time hours away from family away from friends sacrificing uh you know events and so forth and so on to be able to write books and put this kind of information and content out it's not something that's very easy to do so um you know i respect you man i, I really love your work I, i'm just happy that i was able to meet you in this lifetime and to be able to share some wisdom with you, man. I love that. Thank you, Billy. That's beautiful. It's, it's, it's an honor to meet you in this lifetime too. Um, and, and again, it's, it's an honor to be considered next to your book as well. Um, you're a very well-versed person who is, and like you said, we both spend a considerable amount of time trying to piece all this together and review it. Sometimes you can go great amounts of time without finding another one of those little little keys that you're looking for, then all of a sudden, mm -hmm. maybe some passage or some translation connects to another and boom, you can mm -hmm. put all those together. And that's yeah. what this is all about. And like Billy said, we're not trying to say we have all the answers to what happened back then, but we, we're trying to present the evidence that exists for you, giving the theories based on what we've looked at, and then you decide to yourself what's real and what happened back then. Because that's the most important thing of all. It's always just a breadcrumb trail where the individual has to be an objective observer of history at all times and try to figure out what the truth is, truth is for themselves because we're all going to come to slightly different understandings of what occurred back then. And I just want to, um, I just want to end out with a couple little updates here that, um, that we're, Billy and I are planning on doing um, more stuff in the future like this if you guys like it. So please let us know if this is something you enjoy.
And I just wanted to give a little update on uh, what I've been working on at the end too, because I didn't get a chance to. But I just wanted to point out that, so I spent uh, about a, the last week, based on some of the feedback, I ended up putting in um, sub chapters in the entire book. And Billy's book was one of the inspirations behind that. I wanted to help organize the, the information a lot better. So I went through and did um, a rather large update recently. So for those interested, check that out. Um, th that's, that's out now. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping that we can try to do something with like a speaking presentation in the future um, coming up, Billy, if we can. Yeah, that'd be great. That would that would be fantastic. We have to do that. We have to do it. We we will. Let's That's get right. involved in one of those LA type of speaking events. Yeah. Or whatever, and you and I can get in front of a, um, a PowerPoint, and we can really lay out all this evidence, mm -hmm. and we can we can really put this stuff together. I think. Absolutely, and I definitely love would love to have you on my show uh, that I have on Dame Dash Studios Let's uh, do it. for, for Let's Big do it. with Billy Carson. Got to get you on the show. Yeah. That would be awesome. So, um, Billy, I just, I'm going to give closing, closing thoughts and I want to give you a couple closing thoughts, but thanks so much for everyone that's, that supports uh, my work and Billy's work. Um, we really work hard to try to bring these secrets back out, but really we also, the reason we do this is because we really care about this information and we care about the future of where humanity goes. And that's the driving, um, force behind why we really try to make sure we can preserve this legacy of the past. So Billy, it's been a really great discussion with you, my friend. Absolutely, man. Same here. I appreciate it, man. You know, we're just here to uh, literally serve mankind. We're really of service. And I think that's going to create a lot of positive, positive karma. It has created a lot of positive karma for us, which allows us to continue to do what we do. Because uh, to be able to go down the path that we're on, it's not an easy path. And it requires a lot of things to fall in line in your life to be able to allow us to do this kind of research and work because the, t the average person just can't do it. There's a lot of things going on. We understand family, kids, work. Every week. Not that we don't have that stuff, but an alignment has allowed us to be able to accomplish these goals and missions to help mankind. And I really just wanna I thank the universe and I really appreciate the opportunity. Thanks so much, Billy. It's been a great discussion. Until next time, my friend. All right, man, see you later.